Oh, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 21, I believe, of our Planet Zoo mod spotlights. So we've got three more to go until the next update, and a couple specials that are coming out, so I'm really excited to get these all for you guys over the next few days. So yeah, we're going to be starting with this really cool animal, it's by Nicholas Lion Rider and Leaf. We have got the Stock Eye Salmon, also known as the Red Salmon, or the... Uh, blueback salmon. So there are species of salmon that are found in the northern Pacific Ocean and the rivers discharging into it. And this is a species of specific salmon that primarily red during uh, and hue during spawning. As you can see, this is their spawning colors. They can grow up to one uh, 84 centimeters in length and weigh between 2.3 and 7 kilos. Juniles remain in the fresh fresh water until they're ready to migrate at the ocean over distances of over 1,600 kilometers. So these guys are, their diet is primarily uh, zooplankton. And as you can see here, they've got this really cool color. And they range from the Colombian River to the Eastern Pacific and have been found in the northern uh, Hokkaido Island in Japan and also um, the Canadian Arctic and Russia, Siberia, which is really cool. And they actually have seemed to be excavated from Idaho and Oregon. So these guys have uh, limerick feeding behavior, which means they uh, incorporate vertical movement, schooling, diet, feeding, and chronologically, and zooplankton uh, prey selectivity. So they can charge, they've changed their position in the water column and timing and length of feeding, school formation, and choices in prey to minimize the likelihood of predation. So just the risk. They also ensure they get at least the minimum amount of food necessary for survival and all these behaviors contribute to their survivability and therefore fitness of the salmon. And depending on their location, their levels of agree, uh, aggressive feeding can vary. These guys are mainly androgynous or anadronous, uh, where the juvenile salmon migrate to freshwater, from freshwater lakes and streams to the ocean and then return as adults to where they spawned in nat natal freshwater. And similar to most salmon, they are semi pelorous or believe I've pronounced it. That means they die after spawning. And some stockai do not migrate into the ocean and live their entire lives in freshwater lakes. So it depends on the population. The majority of spawn in rivers near lakes and juveniles spend one to two years in the lake before migrating to the ocean. Although some populations will migrate in their first year. So. There's a drastic real sexual dimorphism in these guys. The males go through numerous changes here. And you can see they can see this increase in uh, body depth, hump height, and snout length that you can see in this guy here. That's really what a male breeding salmon looks like. And this could mean that longer snout sizes are sexually selected, but the hump height and the adipose fin and length is not. And they develop large gonads. Females develop large gonads that are 25% of their bottom ends. And females are responsible for the parental care of the babies where they select, prepare and defend a nest site until they die or are displaced. And males do not participate at all and they move between females during egg disposition. So these guys are pretty regulated. Um, these fish harvesters all are harvests all year round, pretty much. Uh, in 2010 there were some 170,000 tons of Sockeye caught and 150,000 tons of that was in, from the United States and the rest was from Canada and Russia. So this encompasses a lot of areas. So commercial fishermen use uh, gill nets and things like that which can be very dangerous and the largest spawning grounds in Asia is located in Kamachua popular uh, peninsula in the far east. And the conservation guys are these obviously considered pretty least concerned but they are heavily managed because they are a resource so they need to be managed as such. And you can get a lot of salmon from these guys. Uh, and they're really cool animals. So they're really important in the food chain as well. As you see them swim up the river. They can fertilize rivers and feed bears and things. Going up there. So yeah, really cool animal. So we move on to the sockeye salmon. We've got another fish. This is by Dutch Designs for Zoo Tycoon 2. And was imported by Leaf. We have got the red tail catfish. Which is a type of, well, catfish. Also known as the Jaro or in Brazil, or known as the Piranarana. And the only extinct member of that genus, and a common in the aquarium trade, even though they get very ma massive. And these guys can get massive. 
They can reach a, a length of 1.8 meters or about 6 feet long and about 80 kilograms. However, they are exceedingly rare and mainly do not approach this size. But they average about 3.5 to 4.5 feet or 1.1 to 1.4 meters. And they have this blownest back with yellow stripes and this orange to reddish dorsal fin that you can see here that gives them their name. So these guys are usually found uh, in the Amazon, Orinoco and Isquilla rivers around uh, Ecuador, Venezuela, Guiana, Brazil, Peru, Colombia and Suriname and Bolivia and Brazil and are found in rich freshwater habitats and inhabit large rivers and streams and lakes. So these guys as I mentioned they're a very very popular aquarium fish but they can only be housed in really large, large aquariums and are often housed with uh, larger fish like paku and other large catfish. Juveniles are often available but this is a big problem with a lot of species in the pet trade is that you get them as a little fish in the uh, when they're juveniles but then they grow up to be huge like these guys and get well over a meter long so that's a big issue for people if you if you're gonna get a fish and you want to take care of it through its life you're gonna need to research that it even happens with goldfish and i just think they're really cool and those have been known to hybridize with other catfish such as tiger shovenel's catfish and through the use of hormones and attempt to cry, create a viable fish food and these hybrids can make it into the aquarium hobby under a variety of different names so that's really cool wonderful wonderful fish big big fishy so now we're going to be moving on to another fish another fish another day let's see if we get one. look at this wonderful guy so this is the humphead wrasse which is a large species of wrasse mainly found in coral uh, reefs in the indo-pacific also known as the maori wrasse or not maori it's maori i don't know why i said maori i keep hearing it on youtube all the time it's maori maori uh, napoleon wrasse or napoleon fish <laughs> I think that comes from the humphead. So they're the largest living member of their group. Males are typically larger than females and are capable of reaching up to 2 meters in length. Females rarely reach more larger than 1 meter. These species can be easily identified by its large size, thick lips and the hump head as you can see. So these guys can be found around the east coast of Africa, around the mouth of the Red Sea, in some areas of the Indian Pacific Ocean. Juveniles are usually found in shallow sandy ranges bordering coral reefs. And the adults are found mostly in offshore and deeper areas of coral reefs. And these guys are very long lived and are very slow breeding. So individuals become sexually mature for five, five to seven years, as they are known to live for up to 30 years. They are protogygenous hermaphrodites, with some becoming male at about nine years old. So usually they are female when they're young, but as they keep growing, they become males and then they start producing obviously those right gamers. The factors controlling this sex change and the timing is not known, but at certain times of the year adult males move down the uh, down current end of the reef and form large spawning aggregations and they do not travel very far from their aggregations. And their pelagic eggs and larvae ultimately settle near coral reefs and habitats and they have small eggs that are small and spherical with no pigment. So these guys are also very opportunistic predators and prey things like a lot of invertebrates such as gastropods, crustaceans, annelids, which are worms, and fish. And they rely on stingrays a lot where they excavate through the um, sand there and they try and pick off whatever food they can can, which is pretty cool. They've actually been seen uh, cooperative hunting with coral groupers. And they are commonly found, these adults are commonly found around steep coral reef slopes and lagoon reefs between 3 and 330 feet deep or a little under a meter to 100 meters deep and they actively selects branching hard and soft corals and seagrasses as settlement and juveniles tend to be more cryptic and hide in dense corals to protect themselves from predators. So they are listed as endangered and for a lot of reasons that includes uh, species specific removal of these guys for the pet trade which is obviously a big bad thing and not only for the pet trade and for fish food so they're also eaten. Uh, destructive fish techniques such as bombing and cyanide, habitat loss and degradation, local consumption, uh, as I mentioned the trade, uh, uh, but there's a lack of good management for these guys as well and not very well known and unported illegal and irregulated fishing. So that is really compacted to the decline but they seem to uh, be on the improving at least. They're considered an umbrella species as well, which means if you protect these species habitats, you protect a lot of species as well. And they uh, can get 
in Taiwan, you can get a fine of, of 1.5 million and jail sentence of six to months to five years if you kill these guys. So that's pretty good. So really, it's just better management of these populations, especially if people want to eat them. But it's still a wonderful fish. Big boy too, up to two meters long. So, yeah. So we have got the Rim Gazelle as well. Look at this wonderful animal. This guy was done by... Z Zigtiv Gaming, I believe that's the name. I need to move this, my list better, so I can see it better. Let's see if I can put it here. Excuse me. Um, these guys are also known as the Slenderhorn Gazelle, the, or the African Sand Gazelle. That's really wonderful there. So they are an endangered species of gazelle. There's only about 2,500 left in the wild. Found mainly around Algeria, Egypt, and Libya, and are considered an endangered species, sadly. So they generally grow to a, a length of 101 to 116 centimeters and the palest of all gazelles and well adapted for desert life and they can have these uh, tails that are about 15 centimeters long with a black um, tip and all that and pretty pretty cool so as i mentioned these guys are around uh, found in golia tuznia libya and egypt and have been reported from niger and chad but these sightings are iffy and we just don't really know they seem to be a nomadic species and rely little on open water sources and they are and do not have a set migratory pattern so they go where they can typically find food their typical habitat usually is sand dunes and the depressions between them and other sandy uh, areas but also rocky areas so as i mentioned these guys are endangered as they were in serious decline because of hunting for sports meats and horns and it was sold as ornaments in the North African market. The threats these animals face include poaching, uh, disturbance by humans, and loss of suitable habitat. Mm -hmm. So the IUCN may only estimate there may be 300 to 600 mature individuals in the wild and have considered them endangered. So that's really sad, but these guys, I think, are wonderful. We can have a look at the female here. I believe that's the female. This is the male sleeping here. Yep, and we can have a look at this cute baby. Good attempt to for a first mod. I think this is uh, Zift Gaming's first mod, and I think he did a pretty good job. Probably better than I would do, because I tried modeling and it didn't really just come to me. But I think this is a wonderful mod. Did a wonderful job. So now let's move on to this one's a cool animal. I love these guys. So this one was done by Tri Tri Tricoart, uh, Leaf, and Nicholas Lion Rider. We have got the have a look at you the parenti so the parenti is a, the fourth largest monitor lizard so that's after the komodo dragon the asian water monitor and the crocodile monitor and are found in sent the great dividing uh range in the arid areas of australia so they're the, like the biggest predator in arid australia they're kind of like the top dog and they're not very commonly seen but they're considered least concerned because they are uh, very kind of like a uh, habitat's not really too much disturbed and are very respected in aboriginal cultures so that's really cool so they're doing they're doing okay so these guys can get huge they can get to a length of two and a half meters long even though they typically reach 1.7 to what, two meters long and weigh up to 15 kilos with a maximum weight of 20 kilos so that's a very big lizard and uh they are the third largest lizard to the crocodile monitor which is often longer but these guys can be heavier and these guys are relatively lean and less bulky, bulky than Komodo and Asian water dragons. Or water monitors, I mean. So, <laughs> so these guys, as I mentioned, they're found in Western Australia, South Australia, Queensland and the Northern Territory. But they are found in very, very uh, arid areas and rocky outcrops and gorges with hard packed soil. So they generally avoid human contact uh, but, and often retreat when they're seen. And being good diggers, they can dig into shelters and also climb trees very well. And they do this really cool behavior, which is tripoding. So it's quite common in monitor species. They'll sit back on their back legs. They almost like the retrosaurs, you know, those old dinosaurs, like the, like the kangaroo. They look like that. It's really cool. And these guys are very highly active carnivores. They eat pretty much whatever they can get their mouths around. Small mammals, reptiles, uh, even birds like diamond doves. But they like to hunt live prey, but they will eat carrion. And these species also display a notable example of uh, 
intergrilled predation, which eats a usually large number of other monitors, such as ridgetail monitors, blackhead monitors, gold monitors, and even argus uh-huh. monitors. So they're like the top dog of the monitors and will eat smaller predators. So Perindis also eat smaller members of their own species, with the case of a uh, one uh, two meter Perinti killing eating a 1.5 meter Perinti. And other prey includes cent- uh, central beta dragons, which is the same species as my pet beta dragons, so makes me a little sad, <laughs> and long-nosed water dragons. So coastal and island individuals often eat a large number of sea turtle eggs and hatchings as well, and they hide under vehicles uh, to ambush savaging seagulls. And their mammalian prey includes animals like bats, young kangaroos, and other marsupials, along with rodents. And they have been seen occasionally foraging for food in shallow water, and although adults prom- pr- predominantly feed on vertebrates, young ones that are just growing and need to get as much protein as they can. Have a look at the protein. There's a little one. There's a little cutie. This is a cool mod. And uh, they've been often seen to see lots of arthropods and grasshoppers and stuff. And they usually uh, swallow their prey whole. And there have been, there's even like a mummified, it's in a museum, there's pictures of it online, of a parenti that died trying to eat an echidna and did not end well for it. And what's really cool about these guys is that also they will lay their eggs in termite mounds. A lot of monitors will actually do this. To protect their eggs from like biting insects and such, they'll dig it in termite mounds and it's a good way to protect your eggs. And I think that's a pretty cool like symbiotic relationship. Even though I think that's just really cool. A wonderful animal. And guess what? The Tricar did like all these little things himself. He spent all this time painting it and it really paid off because it really looks wonderful. Now, the only thing I would like to see is kind of like different color variations as well. That'll be awesome. I think there already is, but I'm not sure. But yeah, look at this wonderful guy. Great. So now we're going to move on to the next animal. We have got the Tibetan blue bear by... Oh, we're over here. Look at these guys. Where are they? There they are. So this is the Tibetan blue bear. So this is done by my friend AD and Janora Pizza. So the Tibetan blue bear is a subspecies of the brown bear. They're found on the eastern Tibetan plateau and also known as the Himalayan blue bear, the Himalayan snow bear, the horse bear, or the Tibetan brown bear. So these are also one of the rarest be- uh, subspecies of bear in the world and they're only very sighted very, very occasionally. And they're known from the west and only a small number of fur and bone samples and was first identified in 1854. So, these guys, um, the Gobi bear is sometimes classified as the same subspecies as these guys, but based on their morphological similarities, and it's believed that these guys are actually a relic population of the blue bear, though however sometimes they are often considered their own species. So these guys, it's possible that the occasional specimen might be observed traveling through the high mountain peaks uh, during times of reduced food supply or search for a mate. However, little information is known about these guys, which makes such speculations difficult to confirm. So, these guys, we just really don't know much about Tibetan blue bears. Their exact conservation status is we don't have a clue. In the United States, trading blue bear specimens is restricted by the Endangered Species Act, which is good. And they have been threatened to by the use of bear bile as a tr- traditional Chinese mar- medicine and culture encroachment. So, these guys are also suggested to be one of the inspirations for the Yeti, and the 19th expedition was uh, to search for the Yeti, led by New Zealander, famous New Zealander Sir Edmund Hillary, found two scraps of fur that was believed to be by locals of Yeti fur, but they were actually turns out to be portions of a blue bear, which is pr- almost as rare, if not more so, because these guys are not very often seen, and I have to say, these little ones, I love these patches of fur, they just look so interesting. I love these guys. Look at these cubs. Look how cute these cubs are with their little white faces. How can you not love them? Adi did such a good job. Watch, we have a drink. Wonderful, wonderful. Such a cool animal. Great, great, great. And next, by just by themselves, Genora Pizza, we have got these. One of the great species of mar. We've got the South Island Giant Moa, and you can see this is the female. Females are actually 280% heavier than the males, and which is pretty much almost three times the size. So they're very much bigger, and you can see these cute babies here. So the South Island Giant Moa 
is also uh, one of the nine species of moa that is known to live in New Zealand. And this was the largest species. So there was two large species of moa in the genus Dionus. There's the North Island Giant Moa and the South Island Giant Moa. The main difference between these guys is the habitat. Obviously, south living in the south, north living in the north. But the South Island Giant Moa was slightly heavier and had a more brus robust skull and all that. So these guys were the biggest of them all. Uh, adults, females stood about two meters tall at the back. So they were they measured here. And if they reared up, they could reach up to 3.6 meters tall or 11 feet tall, making them the tallest bird known. So only one complete specimen is known or of a moa egg, but they are very commonly found in places, even with ancient DNA. So there has been studies to show how that's the reason we know there's nine species of moa. There's been lots of genetic studies to look at these guys and found that they're actually closest living relatives are the tinamous from uh, South America. That shows that they are not very closely related to kiwis at all and the ratai family tree is really really interesting and cool. So these guys lived on the South Island of New Zealand where they pretty much um, just lived in every habitat they could. They lived up in the mountains uh, subalpine habitats and range from grasslands and dunelands and in New Zealand there was a lot of different habitats that these guys occupied and the reason that the males are believed to be so small is that from studies to look at the robustness of moa eggs compared to other birds of similar size like the ratios shows that comparatively moa eggs were very very brittle so it's likely the male was smaller so they could better incubate the babies and then you can see here these wonderful babies here. These ones are based off tinamous. I love the inspiration of the tinamous. I think those are really good. So yeah. And these guys lived very recently. They only went extinct about a few hundred years ago when the Maori people, or the Maori, came to New Zealand and introduced rats and uh, dogs. And they also introduced themselves and killed a lot of these large animals for food. And actually, moa just means chicken. So this guy was just food for these uh, maori and what happened was since they're such slow breeding like they didn't start they didn't reach uh, sexual maturity until 20 years old since they were so slow breeding and only produced one or two eggs maximum they couldn't keep up with the hunting so that's why they were driven to extinction so there is genetic evidence and there has been even political uh, talking about political will you could say to try and research genetics to maybe even bring these guys back from extinction so i think that's really really cool so yeah that's the moa and now we've got by tnt gaming 999 999 we have got the carnotaurus and i love the thing i love about this carnotaurus is that it's got the cassery sounds which is actually the most accurate sounds we probably have we know that dinosaurs are related to birds of course and probably have very similar sounds like dark grunts and booms like uh, large birds and crocodiles. So these guys are a genus of theropod dinosaur. They're in a bellysaurid from the late Cretaceous and lived between 72 and 69 million years ago. And the only species we know of is Carnotaurus sascari, and known from a single uh, preserved specimen that's well preserved, they even had lots of skin on it, is one of the best understood theropods from the southern hemisphere. This skeleton was found in 1984 and was uncovered by the Chicxulub uh, province of Argentina and the rocks of the La, La Colina formation. And it's also a derived member, as I mentioned, of the Balasaurids, a group of large theropods which occupied the large predator niche, similar to like Tyrannosaurus, in the southern land masses of Gondwana in the Lake Cretaceous. So Carnotaurus was a really cool, light, uh, lightly built predator. They measured from 7.5 to 9 meters long and weighed uh, at least 1.35 metric tons. Though the individual that we have is not believed to be fully grown, so they could potentially get bigger than this, but they're probably not by too much. So these guys were very highly specialized compared to other Ballysaurids. They had very long legs and are very slender, and they have these really thick horns here that kind of get these Carnotaurus name. Carnotaurus in uh, Latin meaning meat-eating bull. So you can see they've got this really cool distinctive uh, horns. And they have a very deep skull and a muscular neck along with these long slender limbs which is pretty interesting to show that they probably chased a lot of their prey and their horns may have been used for fighting co-pacifics like a uh, bighorn sheep kind of 
I mean, not in that fashion, but they were used to fight uh, others for the right to mate or territories or whatever they were fighting for. And we know that these guys, since they have ex uh, pretty well preserved, uh, well skin preserved, they had very small uh, scales uh, that are non-overlapping at about five millimeters in di diameter, and it was in interrupted by large bumps that you can see lined on the side of the animal. And there's no hint of feathers, so these guys most likely did not have feathers. And we can also see here, similar to Tyrannosaurus, these guys uh, consistently lost their arms, even to a greater extent than uh, Tyrannosaurs, and lost their arms almost completely. And, and a lot of people have theorized that if the KPG extinction didn't happen, these guys could have potentially fully lost their arms. So, the feeding habits of these guys is unknown, but they're believed to have been able to hunt very large animals like sauropods, but there's also other interpretations that believe they may have been very fast, almost like a cheetah, to catch smaller prey. So, in reality, they probably would have just eaten whatever they can get in their mouths, like most animals do. And the brain cavity suggests that they had a very, very developed sense of smell, while hearing and sight was a little less developed, but well good at smelling, and were adapted for running and is considered one of the fastest theropods. So obviously these guys, they have no conservation status, they're extinct, and they've been extinct for 70 million years, 72 million years, or 69 million years, and uh, I think it's really cool to have these guys in game, I think they fit pretty well. So yeah, now we have got last, but most definitely not least, we have got by Leaf and Archia, um, how you pronounce it, we have got the the whale shark. So this is probably one of the, the biggest animal we've had in the mod pack so far. So this is the whale shark, which is a slow moving uh, filter feeding carpet shark and is the largest known fish uh, alive today, so the largest living fish. The largest confirmed individual is believed to be 18 but 8 meters long, but there have been studies to try and predict their maximum sizes and they have been up to 21 meters long so it's very possible that we could have a 21 meter long individual of these guys uh, alive which is really cool and you can see their pups over here that's so cute so as i mentioned they hold the record of the largest fish and the largest lot of mammalian vertebrate and these are found in open tropical waters all across uh um the world and are really found in waters below 21 degrees and studies of these guys look in the banding of their uh, vertebrae they seem to be uh, live have lifespans between 80 to 130 years so they're very big and long-lived they have these very very large mouths here that you can see that they can open wide to be able to filter small fish and plankton through and it's very similar to other sharks like the mega mouth shark and the basking shark and these guys pretty much exclusively feed on small fish and plankton and they pose no threat to humans other than being way bigger than you and could potentially hurt you if you got too close. Though people can be swim with them pretty safely. There's even like people pay to do it. It's really amazing and it's something on my bucket list. So as I mentioned they're just so enormous. So they are very used to people and they are considered endangered by the IUCN, which means that they are often just hunted for shark fin soup and being so big we don't even know where they breed and we don't really understand the reproduction. They're very slow breeding animals being so large and preying on them and hunting them really impacts the population because it's very hard for them to bounce back. Pretty much all sharks are very slow breeding so that's what really impacts them. And there have been some kept in captivity, believe it or not. There have been some kept at the George Aquarium. They had up to four at one time. And there's a few uh, Avery, uh, not Avery's, uh, aquariums in Japan and China that have managed to keep these guys but not breed them. And one of the cool things about these guys, uh, Id uh, Malagasy, the name is Makaratika, which means many stars, as you can see. They have this really cool pattern with lots of little dots on them that kind of signify and show that they are uh, considered many stars and this is a way of protecting themselves it's uh, to break their outline in the water it's called counter shading as you can see they have this darker body and lighter top and we can see these cute little babies here little pups are born about the size this is pretty accurate they're really only born at like uh, not even a meter long and then they grow into these 12 to 21 meter giants 
that you can see and it's really interesting and they do it over the course of a century so yeah i really love these guys and leafy did it and akia they did a good job and these are wonderful animals so i think this would be a good place to end the video so yeah i really really hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope you guys like and subscribe always remember to hit that little bell icon to get notified whenever i upload anything so yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video if you guys like and subscribe and bye bye